Hey guys, welcome to today's first tax webinar hosted by Enhanced Investor. My name is Steven and I will try to make this topic as interesting as possible. Unfortunately, the subject is taxes, which is a relatively dry subject and it takes a special person to even like talking about it. But at the same time, my understanding is if you trade, if you profit, you should understand some of the fundamental laws and regulations that will impact you so that you will not be surprised come tax season. Unfortunately, I cannot maximize the screen because every time I try to do so, it messes up the screen capture. So just deal with the fact that you'll, you're obviously going to be seeing this in PowerPoint mode. So a little bit about myself so that you guys can make your own decisions if you want to listen to this dude for the next half hour or so. I joined the EI team in late fall 2017. I doubled majored in justice studies and accounting. During my senior year, I was recruited by a public accounting firm. And at work, my niche is in real estate and limited liability companies. Um, tax law is sort of like, you know, civil law, criminal law, uh, family law, in the sense that, you know, no tax professional is going to specialize in all facets of tax. But at the same time, I am a trader, so I decided to take it upon myself to try to understand some of the, some of the basics regarding taxes and capital gains. And uh, my residence is in the Bay Area. What you guys are looking at is my beautiful Husky, and we are obviously in San Francisco. That's the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. So why should you care about taxes? You don't have to, but let me try to um, emphasize four points to hopefully change your mind. The first one is it's unavoidable. You guys have all heard the saying, there are two guarantees in life, death and taxes. Sec second point is I think a lot of traders are sort of jumping into this with the mentality that they just want to trade first, make a boatload of money, you know, buy their Lambo and then deal with the taxes later on. There's nothing wrong with that. If I was in your position, I would definitely do the same thing because I don't want to miss out on a train. I see all these people on social media making crap loads of money and here I am studying about taxes. That just sounds really stupid. It sounds like I'm not prioritizing my things correctly. So that's perfectly fine. But at the same time, let me try to inform you on some of the basics um, during this webinar so that you guys are not completely surprised come tax season. The next point is tax evasion has serious consequences. That should be quite obvious. And the last point is what you keep in your pocket is much more important than what you make. And even if you guys have a CPA that you work with every, um, every tax season, CPAs are humans. They're not robots. So they will make mistakes. So it's very important that you understand um, what you should expect so that you can at least identify some of the deficiencies in your tax return if there are any because your CPA just simply had a, had a short oversight. Now, as you guys are aware, in 2018, we passed a new tax bill. Now, keep in mind, this is going to be in effect in 2018. So that means your 27 tax return that you guys will be filing in a few months will not include these changes. However, for your next year's tax return, it is definitely important that you understand these new tax regulations and these new tax laws because they are going to change your tax return and how much you expect to receive from it. I'm going to emphasize some, some of the key points in this slide about the new tax bill and how it affects you obviously it doesn't cover everything because there's so much um, behind the new tax bill but i feel like these six points can cover a majority of the viewers that are watching this webinar in the first place the first point is it cut corporate tax rate from 35 percent to 21 percent so if you guys are trading u.s equities you guys may have expected a bullish rally from some of these u.s companies to an extent we sort of saw that but not not so much um, to the point where we anticipated originally. The second point was individual tax rates have been lowered. So I have this image on the left hand side and I like it a lot because it shows a comparison between the 2017 and 2018 rates and it's there's no argument behind it. It's not debatable. The tax rates in 2018 are obviously lowered for most individuals no matter what your filing status is. It could be, it could be single, it could be head of household, it could be married etc the third point is your standard deduction has been doubled which is a good thing for you guys now what the standard deduction is is it allows a individual taxpayer to reduce their taxable income by roughly six thousand four hundred 
if they do not use any itemized deductions. So who are the typical parties that are using the standard deduction? Typically the ones that are using the SD are individuals who don't have a home and who don't plan on itemizing a lot of deductions because mortgage interest, property taxes, charitable donations, medical expenses, all of those things are part of your itemized deductions. So if your itemized deductions are more than 6,400, which is a standard deduction, it would be foolish for you not to use the itemized deductions. The fourth point is it eliminated your personal exemptions. Now, every everybody has a personal exemption. What this means is you get to reduce your taxable income by $4,000 if you have, if. If, if you're filing your tax return now if you're an individual who has like say two dependencies such as two kids then your personal exemptions are three that means you get to use four thousand times three so that means you get to deduct your tax income by twelve thousand um, unfortunately for this new tax bill they eliminated the personal exemptions and that means we will no longer be able to use that so it sort of offsets the benefits from the third point, which I mentioned about standard deduction being double, uh, doubled. The fifth point, there is no more mandatory FIFO stock basis rule. Now, FIFO is just an acronym for first in, first out. So let me try to give you an example to clarify what I mean by this and how it affects you as a trader. If you were to buy a share of Apple today for $100 and you were to buy another share of Apple in the future for $120, and then moving on in the future, you were to sell one share of Apple for 150. What is your gain? Well, it depends on your stock. It depends on your cost basis. If you were to use the first in, first out method, that means you would have to account for the first share of Apple that you bought for $100, which was 150 minus 100. So that means your gain would be 50. However, if you were to use the LIFO cost basis, which is last in, First out, that means you would use $120 as your cost basis, so your gain would only be $30. Originally, the tax bill made it mandatory for us to use the FIFO cost basis rule because legislation had this impression that using the FIFO would essentially accelerate our tax revenue because for the most part, most assets that we're investing in at least um, do appreciate in value. So. The IRS obviously wants us to use the FIFO cost basis rule because that will incur a bigger tax liability at earlier years for us. But now they got rid of that mandatory law for the new tax bill. So you get to use whatever cost basis you want, FIFO, LIFO, cost average. And the last point, which is pretty cool, it got rid of the um, uh, Affordable Care Act. So um, health insurance is no longer mandatory for you guys, so you guys can pretty much just drop your insurance premiums and just dump it into crypto if you want. The target audience behind this webinar is obviously you guys. All of the members and all the trialists that are asking me all these questions, I've tried to compile some of the most frequently asked questions that I receive from the, the community as a whole so that I can essentially answer most questions that I think most traders will be interested in learning about. And one of the biggest topics that I receive a lot from members and trialists is um, the topic behind aliens and US residents that are trading abroad. This can seem like a very complicating subject if you were to Google it yourself. But before I move on to the next slide, just let me, let me, try, to, let me try to explain something to you about this and how it's really not that complicating. As long as you can categorize yourself in one of the three categories that I will show on the next slide, that is all you need to know, okay? So essentially you have three groups. If you could put yourself in one of those three groups, which you can, then that's all you need to worry about. It's very self-explanatory. Now in this slide, as you guys can see, these are the three groups that I was just talking about. Try to define yourself as best as you can. Place yourself in one of these three groups and I'll explain a tax situation that will impact you as a trader. The first one is US resident traders living abroad. Unfortunately for you guys, you guys do have the most complicating situation because you guys are subjected to double taxation. 
it does not mean, however, that you need to pay double in taxes. It just means that you need to file two tax returns, one for your country of residence and one for the, the U.S. You guys do get to use foreign tax credits and you may be able to exclude your foreign earned income, but because this situation is relatively complicating, I don't want to bore you guys with all the details. Please just direct message me if you are in a situation and you want to understand how you can pay the smallest amount of taxes, especially if you live in a country that has a higher tax rate than the United States, but you still have a U.S. citizenship. So just direct message me and I'll give you more clarification behind this group. The next group is resident aliens that are investing in the U.S. This means that you are living here in the U.S. You don't have a U.S. citizenship, however. Your situation is very simple. You're going to be filing your tax return. You're going to be paying your capital gains just like a U.S. citizen would. There's no difference. The next group is non-resident aliens that are investing in the U.S. This means that you don't have a U.S. citizenship. You don't live in the U.S. In this situation, you are basically subjected to taxes depending on what you trade and how long you hold it for. So I'm just going to try to lay out the basics so that you can sort of familiarize yourself with the point. If you have any further questions, please direct message me and I'll give you more details behind it. But if you're trading U.S. stocks and you have short-term gains, most brokers will actually withhold your taxes in this situation. However, if you have capital gain taxes, as in long-term taxes, you will typically use a tax bracket that is applicable from your country of residence. Keep in mind, this does not include cryptocurrency. So if you're trading cryptocurrency, you're only going to be paying taxes, short-term taxes or long-term taxes in your country of residence. You don't have to worry about the U.S. In this next topic, I'm going to be discussing more in details about capital gains, losses, FIFO, accounting basis, and tax brackets. The tax brackets are very useful even if you're not filing your own tax return because as you guys are aware when you guys are trading, all of the gains that you're making, you are keeping and then you are expected to pay taxes on it later on when it comes due. So if you don't know how to use the tax brackets, it's going to be very difficult for you to try to understand how much you should expect to incur for your tax liability. So by understanding how to use the tax brackets, you can reserve a certain amount of income on the side that can pay for your taxes when um, tax season is due. Now, in this member's question, his last sentence, he wants to know if there's any legal loopholes that he doesn't know about, but he wants to take advantage of. This is going to require more research on a side for me, so let me reserve it for the next episode, please. So capital gains and losses, it basically comes down to is it a short-term gain or is it a long-term gain or loss? Now, the difference is short-term gains are treated as ordinary income so that means if you had a three thousand dollar short-term gain that is no different than your employer paying you for one week salary of three thousand dollars you will be taxed accordingly by that tax bracket so the short-term gains it will affect traders who have a high income because they are obviously in a higher bracket so that means somebody who has a high income will pay much more in short-term gains than somebody who works minimum wage and makes less than 35,000 a year. Long-term gains are different because you guys are taxed at a favorable tax bracket. And I will go into details more about this on uh, the next slide. The next point is losses can offset your ordinary income, but only up to 3,000. So let's just say you had a really bad year in 2017 and you had a net loss of say 5,000, okay? You get to use 3000 to reduce your regular income. So that means your tax liability is going to be smaller because you just subtracted 3000 from it. The remaining amount, which is 2000 will get carried forward and that can be used as a deferred tax asset that you guys are allowed to use for future years to reduce further income or further capital gains. And um, the last the, the next point I already talked about that the DTA for tax brackets, I will talk about this in the next slide to give you guys a clarified example. But understand that if you have a really high income, you are subjected to 
the NIT tax, which I believe means net in investment tax, something like that. But basically what this is, is if you make over 250K from last I checked in 2017, then you need to pay an additional 3.8% on your investment income. So high income individuals need to pay a 3.8% additional tax on their investment income. Because it's 2018 and we no longer have the Affordable Care Act, I'm not sure if this NIT tax is still going to be in effect because from what I recall, the NIT tax goes directly towards funding the Affordable Care Act. So with the ACA being repealed, I'm not sure if this NIT tax is still going to be in place. Please do your research. And I'll also do my own research to see if I can answer this question um, further on. The next slide, I mean, the next topic is FIFO accounting. Uh, remember, like I mentioned previously on one of the slides, the new tax bill eliminated the requirement for this um, during the last minute. And this is good for traders because it allows us to use whatever cost basis that we want to. We being traders, we obviously want to have money. Um, we, we want to have as much money right now as opposed to the future. So we will use whatever cost basis that, that allows us to incur the smallest amount of gains so that we can pay the smallest amount of taxes on it. So this means we can use FIFO, we can use LIFO, or we can use the average cost. For most traders, you're probably gonna be best off using LIFO because typically the stuff that you're trading, assuming you're a decent trader, uh, most of the stuff that you're gonna be trading is appreciating in value. So you typically wanna use the last in first out method because that is going to give you the smallest amount of gains, uh, which therefore will reduce your tax liability. This next slide is a clarified example, more about capital gains, losses, the length of the hold of your gains, and how to use the tax brackets. In this hypothetical example, I'm gonna be using two traders. You have Jim, you have Kim. And Jim has short-term gains, Kim has long-term gains. And it's also important that you guys understand which tax brackets to use, because like I mentioned before, your short-term gains are treated like ordinary income. So if you have short-term gains, you care about the top brackets because those are your ordinary income brackets which are taxed the same as your short-term gains. Your long-term gains, they get taxed at a favorable different tax bracket and that is the bottom bracket that I'm talking about right here. So um, remember for your upcoming tax return, you will be using the 2017 tax rates because the 2018 rates are not in effect yet. I mean, they are in effect, but it's not going to influence and impact your April's tax return. So Jim has 60K salary income and he has 40K from short-term gains. The way we're gonna calculate Jim's tax liability is just like this. So knowing that he has 60K in salary income plus 40K from short-term gains, we know Jim has a total of 100,000 100, in terms of income because the short-term gains are treated like ordinary income. So just understand that it's the same exact thing. So that means we're gonna be touching one bracket, two brackets, three brackets, and a little bit of the fourth bracket because he only has 100K total. So Jim's tax liability is going to be 9525 times 10% plus 38,700 minus 9,525 times 12% because it's only that window of 38,700 minus 9,525 that's going to be taxed 12%. We're not taxing 12% on the 9,525 and below. The next one is going to be plus 8,500 minus 38,700 times 22% plus 100,000 minus 82,500 times 24%. And that is going to be Jim's tax liability. If you guys need more clarification behind this, just go ahead and direct message me. Um, but understand the percentages that I was using is actually the 2018 percentages. If you're doing the 2017, you're doing the same exact, um, you're using the same exact logic here, but you're not gonna be using the same percentages that I'm using. You're using the 2017 percentages. In Kim's situation, she has 50K salary income and she has 70K from long-term gains. 
So for Kim, we're not going to be adding 50,000 plus 70,000 because that 70,000 is separate. We're going to be using a special tax bracket for Kim's long-term gains. So her, her tax liability, it basically splits it up in two categories. We're going to be worrying about her first salary income. So that's 50,000. 9525 times 10% plus 38,700 minus 9525 times 12% plus 50,000 minus 38,700 times 22%. And because she has long-term gains, we need to treat that separately. So therefore we're gonna add an additional part, 70,000 times 15%. How do I know it's times 15% and not 0% or 20%? Well, because Kim's salary income is 50,000. So that means, assuming she's single, that means that she falls under the category of 38,700 through 426,700. So that means all of her long-term gains will be taxed at 15% for her category. So that's her tax liability. It's, it's really not that complicated. If you guys, like I said, if you have any questions, just DM me, okay? You guys know where to find me on Discord. Now for this next topic, I'm going to be talking about crypto transactions and how the new tax bill affects crypto. Um, word of warning, I want you guys to understand that crypto is still relatively new in the space. And as you guys are aware, the legislative branch is a reactive branch. So that means I expect to see more changes and I, I expect to see further evolution in this crypto space and how the IRS wants to deal with it. But essentially, I'm just going to cover some of the main fundamentals that I think every crypto trader should understand and know about and some of the software and tools that you guys can use to simplify the process. Because even if you were to use a CPA, you would probably piss off your CPA if you were to just dump a giant ass Excel spreadsheet and just be like, okay, you know, have a go at it. Definitely help your CPA so that he can help you. And also, you will also pay less in CPA fees because he's gonna be spending less hours on your tax return. So the first point I wanna address is this loophole that crypto traders were allowed to use in the past and it was an absolute godsend because it allowed us to defer our gains on crypto to crypto transactions now what the loophole was was it allowed taxpayers to defer any gains on like property transactions so that means if you were an individual and you have a business you have a truck for your business and one day you're like i'm tired of this truck i'm gonna swap it for a van you swap it for a van, you realize the gain on it, but you don't need to pay any taxes on that swap because it was considered a like property transaction. The IRS decided to close this loophole by amending the tax section that described the words property by replacing that word with real property. So that means the definition of real property is tangible real estate. So crypto traders are no longer allowed to use this legal loophole. So anytime you swap a crypto coin for another crypto uh, crypto coin you are creating a tax obligation so be well aware of that in the next slide i'll be discussing more about some software and tools that you guys can use to simplify this process and try to make it as um, streamlined as possible because as you guys are aware some traders out there make thousands of crypto to crypto transactions on any given year so um, obviously it's a huge nightmare to deal with this mess the next point is reporting crypto gains and losses essentially when you guys are doing this just understand that you need to classify in short term and long term gains okay so the definition of short term is anything that's held from 365 days or less so please do not sell something on the 365th day because you're just one day away from long-term gains. A lot of people make that mistake where they're like, oh, sweet, it's been 365 days. Let me go ahead and sell today. You, you basically just waited a full year for nothing because you're still gonna be paying short-term gains on it. And once you separate your transactions from short-term and long-term, you're gonna be calculating your net profit and loss for those two sections. Any net loss from any category can offset the other category by up to that amount and I'll talk more about this in the next slide the remaining amount will be taxes ordinary income or capital gains depending on your length of hold 
like I mentioned before, you have two different brackets, one for short-term gains and one for long-term gains. Your short-term gains are treated like ordinary income. There's no difference. And uh, more examples provided in the next slide. Okay, so here is the example I'm, I'm going to discuss more about so that you guys can get further clarification on how this works. In this situation, you bought Bitcoin at 3000 and you sold it for 7366 days later on. So we have a long-term gain here. You bought Bitcoin again at 8,000 and you sold it 366 days later at 2,000. So you just suffered a long-term loss of 6,000 right there. You bought Ethereum at 700, sold it 10 days later at 4,000, short-term. Bought Ethereum again at 1,000, sold it 10 days later at 800, short-term. Your net capital loss for long-term, because that's the section, we're separating the sections here, is 4,000 minus 6,000. That's the first two bullet points that I'm talking about right here. The first two bullet points. And therefore, you have a net long-term capital loss of negative 2,000. Your short-term capital gain is 3,300 minus 200. How did I get these two numbers? From the third and fourth bullet point. So therefore, your short-term capital gain is 3,100. Now... I will use my net long-term capital loss of negative 2,000. I will apply that to my short-term capital gain to offset some of the income. So therefore, my net liability, I mean my net taxable income from investments will be 1,100. How do you know which bracket this is going to be taxed in? Is it going to be taxed in your net, uh, is it going to be taxed in your long-term bracket or your short-term bracket? We know for a fact it's going to be taxed in our short-term brackets because our short-term capital gains is 3,100 and our net long-term capital loss is negative 2,000. So therefore, we have more short-term gains than we have long-term losses. So therefore, the positive 1,100 will be taxed at your ordinary income tax rates, aka your short-term tax brackets, as opposed to your long-term capital gain tax rates. Now, if this was a loss instead, as in you had negative 1,100, then you would use that negative 1,100 to reduce your tax liability by offsetting your ordinary income by 1,100. So that means if you had a salary of like say 50,000 in a year, then you would use that negative 1,100 to offset the 50,000. So that means your taxable income would be 48,900. This next topic I'm gonna be talking about is the wash sale, uh, wash sale rule. And I, I, I didn't necessarily get this question um, recently because it seems like most of the questions that I'm receiving from members are about crypto transactions. Wash sale basically only comes into play for stocks. So once again, if you only trade crypto, just tune me out. You, you, you probably don't need to know about this. But for, for stock traders, understand that what this wash sell rule basically describes is if you sell a security at a loss and you repurchase the same or substantially identical security within 30 days, which could be after or before the realized loss, then the IRS will not allow you to claim that loss on the current tax year you must wait until the next tax year before you can actually use a loss to reduce your taxable income. Instead, the disallowed loss is added to the cost of the basis of the newly acquired security. So that means the loss that you thought you could use, but it turns out you couldn't, it gets added to the cost basis of the newly acquired security. So that means it raises the cost of your new security that you just bought and that will obviously make your gains smaller in the future when you do sell it in the future. And this will trigger, for example, if you sell a share of Apple at a loss and acquire a contract or option for Apple within 30 days. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a stock. If you incur a loss by selling a share of Apple and you acquire a contract or option, which is obviously not a stock, but a derivative, you will still trigger the wash sell rule and this does not apply to crypto because those are now defined as property. All right, the slide that we've all been waiting for, who gets audited? 
I get this question a lot and for whatever suspicious reasons you have for asking me this question I don't really care because none of you guys are my clients I would never need to show up to court to defend you so therefore my reputation isn't on the line however I would like to inform you and educate you as best as possible so that you guys can make your own adult decisions regarding your own financial matters the first point very few taxpayers go to jail for evading their taxes so if you're extremely concerned about going to jail understand that the chances of you going to jail is very very slim unless if you're evading a crap load of money the next point IRS will target those who typically understate their income obvious overstate their credits and deductions which is obvious and who don't file at all so if you're a crypto trader and you have a lot of gains and you don't file at all know that the IRS will look for individuals such as yourself the next point they mainly when I say they I'm talking about IRS auditors they are very keen to individuals who leave outside hustles such as trading and dodgy behavior during the audit now how would they look for this because that's the tricky that's the tricky part and I'm going to be talking about this on a fourth point essentially what the IRS does is they compare evidence that they have compared to what has been reported on your tax return because most of these crypto exchanges don't work too well with the IRS as in they don't send in some sort of 1099 form like your TD Ameritrade broker does to the IRS every time tax season comes due the IRS does not have any sort of documentation behind what you have gained and lost throughout the year now keep in mind if you guys are aware about the crypto space Coinbase went through this whole debacle where they had to report um, the transactions that these Coinbase users were making if they made more than 20,000 I believe in a given year so I expect this to be some sort of precedent in the future and I expect more exchanges to literally be forced by the IRS to report the transactions that the users are making similar to how these stockbrokers are doing it because remember all stockbrokers are required to send in the form a 1099 form to the IRS so that's why evading your stock gains is very stupid because the IRS has a documentation that basically states what you have made and what you have lost throughout the year so if you fail to report it you're not going to be able to fudge around that um, however when it comes to crypto and depending on the exchange that you use it's a little bit easier to do so because your exchange may not even send any sort of documentation to the IRS um, stating that you as an individual have made so and so gains but please do your own research on the side because you are liable for your own decisions okay so understand how your exchange works with the IRS and understand what sort of documentation they provide um, to the IRS government the, the next point the last point is if prosecuted it is very expensive and the fraud penalty and accrued interest and possible jail time so that means if you are caught basically you will just pay some sort of penalty and you will pay um, all the accrued interest on those back due taxes and you may have possible jail time but like I mentioned before it's exceptionally rare for an individual to, um, to go to jail for evading taxes unless you evade a crap load four ways to avoid crypto tax first point buy crypto and your IRA your taxes will be deferred until you distribute the profits this is if you guys have an IRA you guys understand how this works you pay taxes on it when you actually take out the profits from your IRA during that time so for example if you were to like realize some sort of crypto gains right now but it's held in your IRA you're not going to be paying any taxes on it until you take it out in the future out of your individual retirement account the second point buy crypto and your life insurance policy um, I put in parentheses I doubt anybody will do this because the whole point of doing this is so that you defer your gains when you basically pass on this life insurance policy to your beneficiary so what this means is if you have a bunch of gains in your life insurance policy you won't be taking advantage of it 
but when you die and your beneficiary receives your death benefit and all the gains in that life insurance policy, they will obviously be a very happy camper. But I think most of us are somewhat selfish where we want to enjoy our gains while we're still alive. The next point, which is pretty extreme, you moved to Puerto Rico, uh, you, you moved to a Puerto Rico and live there for at least 50% of the year and you buy a home within two years of moving. Now, the uh, Puerto Rico is still considered a U.S. territory, but it's special in a sense that they have their own tax laws. They have zero taxes because residents of Puerto Rico are allowed to use the ta Act 22 in a jurisdiction that is exempt from U.S. federal taxation. And also online businesses that are set up in Puerto Rico can qualify for Act 20 which will tax the profits at 4%. So if you set up an online business in Puerto Rico and you basically treat your trading as that online business, you can qualify for Act 20 and just pay profit taxes of 4%, which is, which is awesome, obviously. Now, in the first situation, if you were to move to the country and live there for at least 50% of the year and buy a home within two years of moving, then you will have zero taxes. And the last point, which... I really don't recommend unless you just really want to get out of this country is you could denounce your US citizenship if anyone does this please let me know because that's pretty ballsy and I would definitely like to hear of an individual who went to that extent to just to save on crypto taxes alright guys so that concludes our first tax webinar hosted by enhanced investor I hope I made this somewhat enjoyable for you guys like I mentioned before the subject does suck it's pretty dry uh, but somebody's got to do it now, you guys can find me on Enhanced Investors Discord chat server. My name is Steven. And if I cannot confidently answer your question due to its complexity, I will find somebody who can because I have connections with all of the big four firms and all, and all the local CPA firms. And everyone in my office has a different um, specialty in different niches. So please allow me to help you. And... Um, one question that I receive a lot is from people who want me to file their tax return. No, I will not do that because I have enough work at my 9 to 5. Sorry. Please visit us at enhancedinvestor.com and thank you very much for watching, guys. Take care.